Good morning, afternoon, or evening. Dr. Richardson here, bringing you Lecture 5. Now, Lecture 4, our last lecture, was about cells. And we talked at length in that lecture about the PM, the plasma membrane, also known as the cell membrane. Draw your attention over here to my little picture of a cell. We talked about how uh, all the parts in there, uh, parts inside the cell. We talked about the nucleus, which is where the DNA is. Uh, and we talked about the plasma membrane. So today we're going to go into a little bit more detail about that. And specifically, we're going to talk about how stuff, material, moves across the plasma membrane, into the cell, out of the cell, into the cell, out of the cell. We talked about how the plasma membrane is the gatekeeper, lets stuff in and out, and it keeps track of all that. So now that we've learned about cell theory and about the structure of cells, today, again, we're going to talk specifically about how stuff, molecules like glucose, oxygen, CO2, water, and also ions, uh, atoms like sodium, potassium, calcium, chloride, magnesium, how all that stuff moves. Now, please do not worry about memorizing how each specific molecule goes in and out of the cell. We are going to talk about the ways that stuff moves but I'm never going to test you on how sodium is moving or potassium is moving. That's not the purpose of the course. I'm focused on the big picture and that you understanding how stuff is moving, not what specific particular stuff is moving. All right, so let's get started. Now, please remember that the plasma membrane, if we took it and we blew it up, it's made of two things, proteins, and these phospholipids. And if you recall, there are two layers, the bilayer of phospholipids, and then there are these proteins that kind of float in the sea of phospholipids. So just to remind you about the structure of this membrane. Now, we do say that the plasma membrane, and I'm just gonna put PM for short, the plasma membrane is what we call semi-permeable. Semi means kind of, and permeable means stuff can move in and out. So the plasma membrane is what we call semi-permeable. And specifically what we mean is some stuff, some molecules, can only enter and exit through the protein portion through the protein portion. See here? Imagine something moving into the cell through a protein. And we talked about how some of those proteins are called transport proteins. So what kind of stuff enters through the protein portion? Hydrophilic molecules. If a molecule is hydrophilic, meaning, hopefully you remember, it would dissolve in water, if those type of molecules want to get in or out of a cell, they must go through the protein portion. So these orange triangles, some kind of molecule, doesn't matter what it is, wants to get in, it's got to use a protein tunnel or channel to get in or out of a cell. By contrast, some other types of molecules can only enter and exit through the lipid part. And you can see here, moving straight in between those phospholipids. Some stuff can do that. And those kinds of stuff are hydrophobic molecules, molecules that don't like water, will not dissolve in water, and very small molecules. If you're tiny enough, you can squeeze right through those phospholipids and get in or out of the cell. So again, hydrophilic molecules move through proteins and hydrophobic molecules move through 
phospholipids. Very important to remember. Now, we got to do a few more definitions before we can really talk about the meat and potatoes of this lecture. So let's introduce you to the topic of solute, solvent, and solution. Uh, for our purposes of today, solutes are the molecules that are moving. Uh, and these solutes are dissolved in a solvent. And for purposes of us and for purposes of the body, the, solute, the solvent is water. Now, when you take a solute, some type of molecule, and you put it in a solvent water, you now have a solution. And that's what we have in our body. We have a solution. We have lots of water, and then we have lots of pieces of molecules and stuff like that. So a solute is a molecule of something. It's going to be in the solvent, which in our bodies is water. And now we have a solution, the mixture that's formed when the solute dissolves in the solvent. Here's a good example. If you take salt and you pour it into a glass of water and you stir it up, now we have a solution. The salt is the solute, the water is the solvent, and now we have a solution. And we're going to use these terms as we move through this lecture. Now, a couple more definitions and then we'll really get into it. Concentration. When you put a solute in a solvent, you might end up with a high concentration of solute, or you might have a low concentration. And that all depends on how many molecules of solute that you have. So we might say, pretend this is the plasma membrane here in gray. On this side, you see lots of these blue pieces of solute. So we would say here that we have a high concentration. And here, there's only two blue circles. So here we have a low concentration. So pretty simple so far, right? High concentration, lots of pieces of solute, lots of molecules in that, in that solution. But over here, low concentration. And finally, we're going to give you the definition of the word gradient. This is very important. Gradient refers to a difference in concentration between two nearby areas that are separated by a membrane. And again, this picture is helpful. So if we, we here's our membrane, separates two areas. And let's look at the difference in concentration. The concentration is higher here and lower here. And now we have a difference in concentration. High here, low here. And that's the key really to everything because stuff, solutes, move in and out of the cell in response to gradients. Stuff is only going to move if there's a difference in concentration, high on one side, low on the other, and then stuff is going to want to move. All right? Now, Animals, and we'll talk about us today, animals, have three main areas of the body where solutes can hang out and back and forth from which they want to move. So inside the cells, there's stuff inside the cells, solutes in there. There's also a lot of water. Believe it or not, you have 25 liters of water inside your 37 trillion cells. If we squeezed you and wrung you out and weighed how much, see how much water was in there, 25 liters would come from inside your cells. Now, and here's a picture of a cell. Here's area number one where stuff can hang out, water and solutes. Now, we also have the ECF, extracellular fluid, meaning outside of the cell. There is fluid there. ECF, there's fluid all in here. 
outside of the cell hanging out. And there, if we wrung you out, we would find 12 liters of water inside your body, but outside of your cells. And finally, we have the bloodstream. Pretend like this is uh, uh, your bloodstream here, blood flowing here. And there's three liters of water in your blood. If we add that all up, we have 40 liters of water in the human body. And water moves from place to place when needed. Solutes, molecules move from place to place when needed. And so these are our different areas. Now we're going to focus on the cell and the ECF, stuff moving, again, across the plasma membrane. But I wanted to show you this slide just so you realize stuff is moving in between these three areas all the time. Water's moving, the solvent, solutes are moving, different molecules, and it's all a solution because it's inside of our body. All right. And again, stuff is going to move because of gradients. If it's high on one side, low on the other, something's going to want to move. All right? So here is the money shot, the meat and potatoes of this lecture. We are going to talk about two main ways that stuff, solutes, move across the plasma membrane, in and out of the cell. We have passive transport, and we have energy requiring transport. Three types of passive transport, three types of energy requiring transport. We're going to go through them, explain them, and then we're going to play with some questions for you about which way stuff will move. All right, let's get started. So, passive transport. Passive sounds like I'm just hanging out, just being passive, just sitting here. And that gives you a clue to the type of transport. Passive transport, there is no energy required. You don't need any energy for passive transport. And passive transport is when stuff moves from an area of high concentration to low concentration. Another way we say this is it moves down the concentration gradient, from high to low, moving down the gradient. Uh, for example, from an area of high concentration to an area of low, moving that way, that's passive transport, from high to low. I like to use the analogy of a party. Let's pretend there's a party at your house on Saturday night. You invited 50 of your best friends, and they're all in your house, standing around, having some food, talking, maybe dancing a little bit. Everybody's having a good time. And let's pretend like, oh, I'm getting hot. Ooh, it's hot in here. I want to go outside. Uh, well, it's less crowded outside. There's less people outside. So you're moving from an area of high concentration to low concentration. No energy is required for that. You step outside, get a bit of fresh air. The opposite of that is energy requiring transport, because this is transport when stuff will move from an area of low concentration to high concentration. We say that stuff's moving against the gradient when you want to go from low to high. And when you want to do that, you need energy. So going back to our picture, if this little ball here wanted to move from area of low to high, it kind of be pushing. It'd be going against the gradient. There's pr Pretend like this is your house. Everybody's inside and you're outside and you want to get back inside. It's crowded in there. You got to push your way in. You got to use some energy. So one more time. When you're going from an area of high concentration to low, going down the concentration gradient, you don't need any energy. Three types, we'll get into those in a minute. But when you want to move from an area of low concentration to high concentration, you're going against the gradient 
and you must have energy for that. Energy comes in the form of ATP. We'll get into that more later. All right, now let's zoom in on the three types of passive transport. And again, this is moving from an area of high concentration to low. The first type of passive transport is called simple diffusion. Simple diffusion. And this is when solutes, molecules, stuff moves through the lipid portion of the membrane. So simple diffusion is when we have stuff moving through the lipid portion, like this. So they're hydrophobic molecules or very small molecules. So simple diffusion, solutes are moving, and they're moving through the lipid portion of the membrane. And I uh, have a little hand-drawn picture here. You might want to do a little table like this yourself. You see I've written passive transport. Um, and what we have is stuff moving from high concentration to low, and no energy is needed. First type, simple diffusion, and stuff is moving through lipid, through the lipids. Okay? All right, good. We'll come back to this picture in a minute. Second type of passive transport is osmosis. And osmosis is not when solutes are moving, but when water is moving. Osmosis is when water moves through the protein portion of the membrane. So again, water is going to move through a protein. Still from high to low concentration, but it's the movement of water, not solutes. And the third type of passive transport is facilitated diffusion. And this is going back to solutes moving, but this is when solutes move through the protein portion of the membrane. And I tell you a little bit of what's moving just in case you care, but again, I'm not concerned about that. I'm concerned about you understanding the three types, what's moving, what it's moving through, and that all of pa passive transport is moving from high to low concentration, no energy needed. And here I've written passive transport, uh, osmosis, the movement of water, and again we go from high concentration to low concentration and no energy is needed. And in osmosis, water is moving through the protein portion. Okay, good. Excellent. Show you a couple pictures. Diffusion, moving from an area of high concentration to low. There's a lot more blue balls here than over here. It's like the crowded party. You know, you're hot. Everybody's inside. You want to move outside, get some fresh air. Moving from high to low concentration. Moving and you don't need any energy for that. Here's another slide. I like this one because it shows both facilitated diffusion and plain diffusion. Again, you see the diffusion is through the lipids from an area of high to low. And you see the facilitated is through a protein, but again, going from high concentration to low. Okay? Passive transport. Now, osmosis is, don't forget, it's the water moving, not the solutes. A lot of people get confused when we go to our questions about which way something's going to move because they're thinking about solutes when they should be talking about water. So if you get a question on a quiz or a test, be very careful to read the question, what am I asking you? Am I asking you which way water's going to move? Or am I asking you which way solutes are going to move, okay? Now, water does move in and out of cells all the time because water likes everything to be kind of even, and we have the right uh, even amount of solutes and water on both sides. So osmosis is happening all the time. At this point, I would like it if you would pause this video.
and go to YouTube and watch. This is a great little video. It, sh it, it really shows you and you can see the animation of stuff moving and that's why I really like this video. So pause it. It's only a few minutes long. I'll be here when you come back, okay? All right. Hopefully you watched the video. Now we're going to talk about energy requiring transport. Again, must remember, we're now flipping it we're going to move from an area of low concentration outside the house back into the house, high concentration. Again, we have three types of energy requiring transport. We have active transport. Active, sounds active, right? You need some energy to be active. So that's the clue again, active transport, energy requiring transport. And in active transport, solutes are moving through protein portion of the membrane. The other two types of energy requiring transport are endocytosis, endo sounds like into, and endocytosis is when a cell brings stuff into the cell, kind of like bulk not just bring one molecule at a time, but something big, bringing it into the cell. And exo sounds like exit. And so exocytosis is when a cell uh, takes stuff and sends it out of the cell. Usually some kind of waste products or a protein that was made in that cell but needs to go elsewhere. So active transport endocytosis and exocytosis are our three types of energy requiring transport taking stuff solutes from low concentration pushing into an area of high concentration because we're pushing in we need energy for that uh, over here on my little table i wrote active transport movement of solutes from an area of low concentration to high concentration, energy ATP is required. In active transport, stuff, solutes, moves through protein. And in exo and endocytosis, stuff is actually being moved using vesicles. We'll show you a picture of that to clear it up. Now, the energy that's required for energy requiring transport is ATP. And we're gonna learn a lot more about that in lecture six and seven, because we're gonna talk about specifically the energy in cells. But for now, we'll just introduce you to this molecule. This is the molecule that carries the energy for energy requiring transport. Here's a nice picture for you. Uh, we want to move from an area of low concentration, only two outside the house, into the house. High concentration here, from low to high. Active transport uses proteins through a protein, not through the phospholipid. And you see a little like lightning, ATP, because ATP has to give itself to make that stuff move from low to high concentration. Endocytosis is, again, when we want to move something big, not just one little molecule or something, but something solid. So this particle will bump up against the plasma membrane, and the plasma membrane will kind of cave in and make a little vesicle and bring that particle into the cell. Endocytosis into the cell. And exocytosis is exactly the opposite. Something maybe we made in the cell and we got to get it out of the cell. So package it in a little vesicle. The vesicle will bump up against the plasma membrane, open up and kick that stuff out of the cell. Exocytosis. All right. Another great break. Let's take a little break. Watch this short video about active transport, and then I'm going to give you a couple questions to answer. Okay. Now, let's take a look here because this 
represents the ways that I'm going to ask you about how you know this stuff on a quiz or a test. So let's set something up here. Uh, here we have the cell inside of the cell. Here's the plasma membrane, plasma membrane. And here's the ECF, extracellular fluid. So I just took cell and ECF from there, put it here, and this line is the plasma membrane. Now, when I give you a problem, you always have to understand we're going to add up to 100. I'm going to tell you how much water, how many molecules of water are on each side, inside the cell and outside. I'm going to tell you how many molecules of solute are inside and outside. And then I'm going to ask you, which way will the solute move? Or I might ask you, which way will the water move in osmosis? So let's go through this. Here, inside the cell, 90 molecules of water, 10 molecules of solute. 90 plus 10, we got 100. Outside the cell, we have 10 molecules of water and 90 molecules of solute. So in this question, we're going to be talking about passive transport. So remember, from an area of high concentration to low, if you have 90 of solute here and 10 of solute here, higher, lower, the question is, which way will the solute move if no energy is being used? And if you hear that, if no energy is being used, you immediately got to think passive transport, high to low. So the answer will be solute will move into the cell, area of high to an area of low. The water doesn't even matter here, only the solutes from an area of high to low. So the solute will move into the cell. There you go. Now. Let's talk about osmosis. What if I gave you a problem that said we have 10 milligrams or 10 molecules, excuse me, of solute inside the cell and 90 molecules of solute outside of the cell. And then I might ask you, which way will water move? I'm not even going to tell you how many molecules of water there are. But you should be able to figure that out once I tell you how much solute. Because again, we're adding up to 100. So if I said there's 10, milligram, 10 molecules of solute inside the cell and 90 molecules outside the cell, you should automatically go, okay, there's got to be 90 molecules of water inside and 10 outside because we got 100 on each side. And now water is going to want to move from an area of high concentration, 90, to an area of low concentration, only 10. So in this question, even if I don't tell you how much water there is, you need to be able to figure that out using how much solute is there and then telling me which way water will move. And in this case, water will move out of the cell, from the cell into the ECF. And finally, what if I gave you a question that says, we have 10 milligrams of, 10, sorry, molecules of solute inside the cell, 90 molecules of solute outside of the cell. And what if the question says, in which direction will the solute move if energy is being used? Then you're going to, oh, that's active. We've got to move from an area of low to high so the solute will move out of the cell. Please watch these last few minutes a few times over to make sure you can answer the questions on the quiz 
and on the final, okay? These are exactly the questions I'm going to ask. They'll always be 90 and 10, 90 and 10, and you have to make sure you're adding up to 100 on each side. Even if I don't tell you how much water there is, you should be able to figure that out if you know how much solute there is, okay? Excellent. Uh, another look at osmosis. Uh, these amoeba sisters make very, very cute videos. I think because they're cute, they are easy to understand. So take a look at that. Do not confuse the movement of water with the movement of solutes. And as always, uh, a link to this video that I've just made will be attached at the end of the lecture. Okay, everybody, lecture five. Not a lot of material, but a lot of thinking and a lot of problem solving. All right, we'll see you next time. Have a good day.